I'm going to be focusing this talk uh, on how the material design team has used design principles to help communicate material design as a system to a very wide audience. Uh, so I think a little bit different than maybe some of the uh, talks before, but hopefully there'll still be some things that are good takeaways for you here. Um, many of you have probably heard about material design. Um, when I started on material design, it wasn't called that. It, it didn't even have a name. Uh, all we had was the outline of a problem. Uh, and that was, how do we unify the visual expression of Google products on Android? Uh, and the answer to this question kind of comes in two parts. You know, the first part, the obvious part, is we need a design system. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Like, every designer loves to build a design system. The second part? Uh, is, well, we're going to need to partner across disciplines. We need to document it extensively. Uh, we need a comprehensive messaging strategy. Uh, we have to institute review and enforcement policies, uh, provide mechanisms for incorporating feedback. Yeah, yay. <laughs> um, before you bolt for the doors at the mere mention of enforcement policies, um, this isn't about all of that work. This talk is about design principles. And the good news is that a good set of design principles will actually help you with all the things in the bottom part of that slide. OK, so coming back to that initial challenge for material design. Um, in typical Google fashion, we expanded this challenge. We like to make our problems bigger, not smaller. Um, so this rapidly became, um, well, what if it was everywhere <laughs> instead of just on Android? What would that mean? Um, and if you flash back to 2013, um, everywhere was already a pretty confusing space. You know, had phone and tablet uh, and desktop and laptop. You had portrait and landscape. Remember when you used to design for landscape? Um, and, uh, and that wasn't even counting wearables and auto and all these other services that we knew would be coming eventually. Uh, but we weren't done making it hard on ourselves. We expanded again, and we said, well, what if this wasn't just for Google? What if this was to bring any brand, any products brand, and make it be able to be part of that design system? So when you reach that point, you're not really creating a design system at that point. You're actually creating a design system for creating design systems, a style guide for style guides. Um, and it took us a little time to recognize that. We were really focused on that original goal of, OK, let's solve for Google, let's solve for Android. And as it got bigger, I don't think we kind of immediately really realized what it would all entail. Um, but we've continued to work on it. And if you kind of were following some of our announcements from just three weeks back at I.O., um, we introduced material theming. And that goal is still being kind of pursued in that set of launches. And we want to be able to take that core material design system make it customizable enough for anybody to employ that can bring their brand to it fully, uniquely, uh, and powerfully. And our hope for material theming is that if we provide you with the customization tools, you're going to be able to take that baseline. You're going to be able to turn it into something that really reflects your brand. And knowing that our users or designers themselves has affected how we think about design principles in that context. Um, once you support customization uh, and become expansive to include many possible brands, you need to make sure that the principles you define um, are going to be compatible with other values that you just don't know. You don't know what the values or the principles your end users are going to want to bring to the system. Um, so, you know, Jordan brings ideas around what Glassdoor wants to create, so that it wants to be valuable, simple, well-crafted. And Celine is pursuing different goals for Shopify. And either of them might work with a product team or a feature team, as Celine described, that may have even more specific goals that they've captured, either as goals or principles. You want to make sure that you can work with all of that. So I envision kind of three tiers of design principles. Uh, system, or if you prefer, platform at the top. Uh, brand, which also includes marketing principles and, and some flavors. Uh, and product. Uh, and yes, I'm showing my personal flavor bias by making system the chocolate in this Neapolitan uh, <laughs> confection. 
For a lot of designers, these distinctions aren't always important. You might be a strawberry of a brand or a product uh, designer, uh, and you may not have a need for kind of having all of these tiers because maybe your brand is really associated just with one product, uh, and you don't have a, a larger suite that you need to cover. But when you're on that top tier and you're building a system that is going to be employed by others that want to bring their own voices to bear, uh, the distinction matters a lot. Uh, if those principles that you're doing at the top are at odds with what a user might want to do in those other tiers, well, then you have a mismatch. You've got an incompatibility. You've got an indication that the system may not actually be right for that user. And we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to make material as suitable for a wide range of brands as possible. Uh, we can't guarantee that but we've strived as much as we can to kind of make sure that it isn't um, at odds with somebody else. So we relied heavily on a set of example apps as we built material. Um, these were all made up brands, uh, hopefully addressing real use cases in a variety of different product contexts. So this is a really fun job to give a designer, by the way. It's just, okay, we need a fake shopping brand. We need the color palette for it, logo, icon. You've got two days, go. Uh, people jump at that. That's a fun time. Uh, we call these material studies. We actually document them all in our spec. So if you go to material.io, you can look at all the things we've created there. As a system creator, as you're thinking about those system principles, um, you want to be confident that the things that you're advertising about the system are both an accurate reflection of the system and specific to that kind of uh, system level tier and not prescriptive of the others. If you get either of these wrong, um, you're indicating a mismatch where it might not exist. And that could be either because someone um, thinks that your system isn't going to be right for you because the principles are dissonant with what they want to do and they choose not to explore it. Or perhaps even worse, they see what you're advertising, they start using the system, and they don't really get that experience that matches the principles that you've set up at the top. Uh, those are both bad outcomes. And in my experience, the best way to avoid any of those and get it all right is that you let the principles kind of emerge in a grassroots, emergent way, come from the work that you're doing. For the systems that I've been a part of, principles haven't been something you start from. They're the things that you find along the way through that hard work of design exploration. And I'm going to say this a second way just for emphasis. Uh, for design systems, the principles shouldn't be the goals of your system. They should be the expression of the philosophy that is actually encoded into the system that you've built. It should be not what you wished it would be, but what it really is in reality. Now, you may have, uh, you may have ideas at the beginning, and that's fine. Um, there will be themes that you know you're going to focus on. You're not starting with no direction. There's obviously like some thrust that you're pursuing. You know, for us, based on that kind of challenge statement I talked about at the beginning, we knew we wanted to have one adaptive design. So we knew we had to work across all these different systems, so that principle emerged pretty quickly. We wanted to be suitable across platforms and for a wide audience. But we didn't know at the start how important a role motion design was going to play within material as a system. You know, motion providing meaning was an idea we anchored to you know, partway through the, the gestation process of the system. And even the first principle, this idea that material is the metaphor, is something we only recognized as we built this. Now, I mentioned that we didn't know the name of this was material design. We didn't know the name of this was material design until about six weeks before we launched. Um, it was quantum paper internally for a very long time. Yeah, I know, it's sexy. Uh, whew. Uh, so the point was, you know, paper describes all these, you know, material surfaces that kind of fits in quantum because they're, they're magical, uh, like technologically magical. They can do stuff and transform. Yeah. Now, marketing did not see us. Um, so it didn't work as a public facing name. Yeah, quantum paper. So uh, we, when the naming changed, uh, we actually had to implement a swear jar. 
Uh, so teammates would have to throw money into the jar every time they said the Q word uh, so we could break our habits because we'd been talking about quantum for like almost a year and it was suddenly, no, 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 it's only material, never quantum. Uh, this might sound a little bit chaotic. It may have felt a little bit chaotic at the time, um, but with the benefit of a little distance from it, like, I really wouldn't have had it any other way. Like, you really need to kind of build the system to understand it. Um, in the, even in our most recent update, there was a similar kind of process. We had a lot of different code names for it. But the way that we would talk about it would come from these kind of phrases that the team would use constantly during the kind of development process. And we would talk about controlled flexibility or brand expressiveness or customizing, but with guardrails. Um, that date back years, and it really still reflects the way that we think about the system. But the name material theming came kind of not from us, but from what we would hear from early access partners as we would show them what they're working on. You know, we'd show them a little bit and they'd talk us through it and think about what it meant for them. And theming was something that they used all of the time. So we're like, okay, that's good. We can listen to that. Um, and that shouldn't be surprising. We, we're applying user-centered design to the creation of the principles themselves. You know, this is where your users will ideally start their engagement with your system. Uh, so tailoring the way that that's framed to the way that they might talk about it after the fact seems like a way, great way to go. I say ideally, that's not usually the reality. Um, where do your users really start with a design system? Uh, let me just take a quick poll. How many people here have worked on welcome or out-of-box experiences? Where are my Ubi groupies? Okay, yeah, there you are. Um, question, how many of you believe that your users will read all of the text that you write into that? No. It just doesn't happen. Uh, they will come to the screen and it will be swipe, 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 and done. They want to get to the good stuff. And designers are the same way. When you hear about a new app redesign or a new design system, is your first impulse, I really wonder what their design principles were and how they encoded the fundamentals of their system. No, you never say that. You say, what does it look like? You just want to see. You can't fight that impulse. You're not even looking at me right now, you're looking at that. <laughs> you want to work with that energy. Like, that's the way designers are built. So steer into it. Um, pick examples that both look great and ideally express the, or pick examples that look good and express the principles of the system itself. Try to sneak it in there. And if you can make the principles part of the messaging rollout, that's even better. Include them as part of the kind of elevator pitch about what you're doing within the system. Um, for our first launch of Material back in 2014, we had these like, lovely uh, giveaways on hand for people who actually came to the I.O. conference in person. Um, I've got one of them up here that you can take a look at later. But they, it's kind of a combination of a gridded sketch pad, but then you open it up and it has these little mini posters for each of our design principles. Um, it's an old trick, but when you wrap a message that you want to kind of get out into something that's kind of desirable uh, and maybe a little rare, and it's something the recipient is going to kind of take with pride and maybe show off to other designers back at their company, uh, that works pretty darn well if you can get budget approved to do it. <laughs> so getting designers to the principles is important because examples are not going to be enough. They're important but they're never sufficient. Um, we are good, as designers, at recognizing patterns. Um, so good that we often over-rely on those skills. We look at a, a sequence of examples and we pull away the most obvious connections between them. And occasionally we'll miss the kind of more nuanced ones. So as an example, um, I've recently been using Duolingo to learn some basic German. Uh, and this is a great app. I've really appreciated working with this on a kind of, uh, honestly, a daily basis to just get a little bit more uh, sophisticated. Um, the, it uses a strongly pattern-oriented approach of here's an example, translate it, go in one direction or the other. Here's a different example, translate that. 
And that works great for building out vocabulary. You get to see that same word in a lot of different contexts, and you get to see a lot of variations and get a feel for it. That worked great for vocabulary for me, but I still wound up picking up a traditional German textbook to get the grammar basics, because that's something I felt like I wasn't getting for me from this style of presentation. Your design principles can be like those grammar rules. At the end of the day, they're a good starting point for helping you uh, communicate to your users. They can be a shorthand to help get your audience towards fluency with the larger system. So they can apply that full vocabulary thoughtfully and correctly. Um, and these principles become really critical as you increase to scale. So most of us have at some point worked in a smaller UX team where you might have a creative lead who's kind of the walking, talking embodiment of your design system. You know, it's an oracle that you, you reverently approach uh, and you petition for guidance. Now, this is a really brittle approach. What happened if that person got hit by a bus or worse, went to a different team? Uh, <laughs> and it gets even worse because this shatters completely once you go up even a little bit more in scale, either because um, you have more people that need the Oracle's attention and they can't really kind of scale to support that, or as it happens more rapidly than you might expect, the design system can't actually fit just in one head any longer. So I argue that a design system only really comes alive when others can use it. You want to, really you need to, take the system out of the heads of the people that created it. At scale, your users will never encounter, they'll never get to shake hands with or talk to the creators. They'll only get to kind of encounter the artifacts they've left behind. So you need to document the system. It's, it's the only way. And spoiler alert, not everyone on the team will be thrilled with this idea. Um, if no one on your team is excited about doing this, you may not be ready to make a design system yet. In my experience on the really fine teams that I've been lucky to work with, there's usually someone who is excited, who kind of puts the hand up, the music swells, the, the narrator says, a hero will rise, uh, and they jump at it. Because that person, that person really gets what it is to be a system designer. Uh, that's kind of the truest. And it might not even be a designer. If you're lucky, it might be a content strategist. Um, regardless of their discipline, that hero is going to be tested. Uh, once they start documenting, they're going to see Oh boy, is there a lot to be captured. They're going to see, we didn't really figure everything out yet. And they'll quickly understand that even on the team, we actually don't all agree on what is in this system and what the principles should be. Um, capturing the rules can cause your teammates to respond to them in a different way. Like the act of writing it down causes people to look at it and say, no, not that different, wrong. These are all features. These are not bugs of the system. Like This work will make your design system stronger by going through the act of documenting it. You will never be perfect. You will never be complete. No matter how many examples and counterexamples you produce, you're never going to be able to cover every possible case. Um, so remember this idea of thinking about design principles as a shortcut to fluency. Um, your Designers who created the system get that fluency by, by putting in the reps, right? Um, we even use the language of fitness. There's design sprints. It's a marathon. We're doing exercises. Uh, there are no cheat days as a system designer. When you can encode some of the knowledge gained in this way and capture it as principles, it becomes exportable. It, it gets out of the heads and out into a place where other people can use it. It's not locked up in their heads and in their hands. Um, it may not be perfect. It won't be perfect, but it'll certainly be useful. And that's what we're going for. So for your users, uh, principles help guide their decision making. 
when they're faced with many choices within a system that gets larger and larger and larger, they help light a beacon for how to move in a consistent direction. Um, these core ideas help the users uh, navigate all of the unavoidable ambiguity that, that comes from building large systems. And that's why we focus on making the principles memorable. You want them to kind of load into people's brains very rapidly so that they're there as kind of a shorthand. You want to have a little bit of, of hook to them and be catchy. But at the same time, not contravening any of the more uh, nuanced guidance. So if you call back to the scary slide from the beginning of the talk, I said the principles would help in a lot of ways. Uh, we definitely focused on how we kind of document. But for a couple of other points, you know, partnering across disciplines. Um, Principles often apply in a lot of different contexts. So if you can kind of cue your developers about what the big themes in the system are, that may point to something that they want to make an additional investment in because they're going to see it in component after component or pattern after pattern again and again and again. If you're trying to message across the org, these kind of terse, catchy, uh, and importantly, repeated consistently messages uh, help really kind of shift the cultural mindset. You will really know you are onto something when you hear your own principles being voiced back at you from other people on the team. It's a great moment. And I'll jump ahead to the last one, planning for inevitable change. The principles become this great measure that lets you know whether the new things you're doing are expanding the system or altering it. You know, if something new doesn't line up with the existing set of principles, uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you need to be really thoughtful about, okay, how does this new thing fit into all the other guidance we've given in the past? Um, and making sure that you think about how you communicate that shift to your audience. In the end, design principles are just another tool, another resource for fast forwarding a user's understanding uh, of your system. So just like a sticker sheet or an icon library, they get designers into your system and working with it faster. Consider how somebody would describe your system after using it for a day or a week or a month. If you can shortcut someone forward to that level of understanding, you've saved them a tremendous amount of effort. Thanks for your time and attention, and I am happy to answer questions.